My name is Bill Wong. I'm a uh, senior content director and editor at Electronic Design Magazine. And while my title uh, talks about generative AI, I'm going to be talking about AI in general on micros. And we'll be uh, talking about generative AI as well. Uh, that's one of my first passes at generative AI as our, my little dragon. And we'll be seeing him as we sort of wander through all this uh, in terms of our presentation. And Okay, there we go. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking about how we can run these kinds of things on microcontrollers. Now, at this point, just about everything is a microprocessor and so on. And in terms of embedded systems from electronic design, we talk about everything from these little two by two uh, millimeter microchips all the way up to, say, things that are going to be running x-ray machines and things like that. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the stuff that's, you know, the larger enterprise servers, cloud servers, things like that, where we're talking about thousands of processors, usually uh, gobbling up uh, kilowatts, oftentimes per board. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on in between. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of tasks can be addressed at the microcontroller end and why that's changing as we're going along. And finally, we'll talk about a little bit why it's so hard to put AI on the edge. And uh, that's usually the terminology we use for those types of things that are going to be mobile or uh, dedicated devices like clocks and refrigerators and things of that nature. So what I wanted to first do is contrast something that a lot of engineers tend to be familiar with. Uh, a lot of them are not necessarily familiar with uh, artificial intelligence. It's relatively new. It's actually something that's been around for decades, but it's become more practical and more popular now for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into. Now, if you want to take a look at something like a fast Fourier transform, that's a tool that engineers have been using for a very long time. The thing is, while we get taught on how it winds up being used and so on, for the most part, when we're actually using them, we're looking at it as if it's a black box. We're going to be putting something in this way. We know what's going to be coming out the other end, and it's going to be a useful tool that we can put into our applications. That's essentially the same kind of thing that the majority of people are doing with machine learning at this point. They're not necessarily coming up with new models. They're not necessarily understanding all the details of what's going on inside, but they're being able to take advantage of what they uh, can use because people that have developed it essentially allow you to put something in one end and get results at the other end. Now, for uh, a lot of the neural networks we have, it may be something where you're getting an image in and you're recognizing what kind of item is at the other end, or actually what item is in the image. For something like generative AI, you're giving it typically a description of something that you want to have the system analyze and then in turn give you a result like our little uh, dragon there. So essentially I asked for an orange oriental dragon and poof, it came out the other end. Now, from my standpoint, I'm using uh, generative AI, but in terms of what I actually had to know in terms of getting it to work, I didn't really have to do a whole lot. So that makes it very similar to what, you know, we have in terms of the fast Fourier transform. Oh, and by the way, if anybody has any questions, comments, or whatnot, just dive right in because I'll be able to answer those and hopefully we'll get to a bunch at the end. Now, AI is something that's been used in the cloud. It's something that's been used potentially on, on uh, larger systems. The question now comes up, you know, why do we need artificial intelligence at the end? We've been going fine with microcontrollers for decades at this point. Why is it so important to get AI in there? Well, there are a lot of problems when you're going to be going to the cloud. For example, there's communications involved. There's latency that's involved. Likewise, if you're going to be moving stuff through a communications channel, that's someplace where somebody else can intervene and potentially grab that information. You may not want that to have happen. And uh, there are a lot of useful things that AI can do. For example, it may be able to recognize that you are a person that's coming into a particular room and you have a door that's there, but you only want to open the door when the person is actually coming towards the door as opposed to moving off to the side. Now, there's a lot of other ways to get around that in terms of using radar and other things, 
But uh, in terms of being able to recognize somebody, that's something where uh, AI comes into play. Okay. Now, some of the things I sort of mentioned some in terms of object recognition, here's a bunch of them. And uh, if you like V, like I do, it's a neat movie, but I happen to use it here a lot. Um, a lot of these things can be done with very, very low end microcontrollers, like we're gonna be getting into. Some of the things are going to be potentially more difficult. You need more processing power and more memory and so on. Now, the challenges are significant. The amount of performance that's required for some applications like image recognition or trying to recognize uh, movement and things in, in a video is gonna be significantly more challenging than say taking a look at a motor to see whether its vibration is going to indicate that it's going to be breaking down in the next month. So designers have to balance how much power they have available to them and what type of computational unit you're going to have, how much storage is going to be involved, because a lot of these AI models take up a significant amount of storage, especially compared to applications that were normally used in the past. So let's get down into why it's so challenging to talk about artificial intelligence at the edge. And this is one of the reasons. AI is this big term that everybody likes to talk about, but you actually have to get down into the details as to what kind of um, AI implementation that you're going to be talking about. And these are only the ones that are strictly talking about neural networks, which have become very popular. In the past, when I was actually starting out with uh, doing AI work, we had something called expert systems. They're rule-based systems, and they're still around. They're still very valuable. The challenge with those was always in terms of the training. Typically with those, you would explicitly make up the rules, and then you'd have a program which actually would use those rules, and then you would essentially see something that would respond based upon those rules as opposed to a particular process that you may have programmed in your application. And it would be very easy to change the results or how a system operated by modifying those rules. The problem is that the person that had to put those rules in had to know a lot about what was going on. And making the modifications was a challenge. Now, with the neural networks that we have, the training that is actually being done is something that is based upon the model that you have and then essentially you give it a bunch of examples and then you say, okay, this is a good example of what I want and this is a bad example. Or it may be more specific. Here is uh, a cat, here is a dog. I'd like you to be able to identify those things and I'll give you a whole bunch of pieces to uh, locate, or not locate, but, but to observe and I'll tell you which one is, is the uh, case. Now, the big difference between the neural networks and the uh, rule-based systems is the rule-based systems were very explicit in terms of a, a binary in, input and output. With neural networks, we're talking about percentages. When it gives you a result, it's usually a probability that, okay, I'm 90% sure that this is this kind of dog as opposed to this kind of dog. And it's not usually a 100% or even close to that, but it's usually good enough for what kind of application that you want to have. It's one of the reasons why AI for things like self-driving cars are typically going to be backed up by other systems. Uh, raw radar, for example, say, I'm not going to come in uh, more than five feet from something else, because even though I can't tell what it is, I know I don't want to run over something. The other part, which is actually the title and which everybody has been uh, talking about these days, is generative AI. While it's, again, part of AI, the way those transformers work for generative AI is a bit different than the way the various neural networks are operating. Now, here's the other challenge that you have when you're going to be dealing with trying to figure out what you're going to be putting into these microcontrollers. And that is, 
which one of these approaches and which one of the models within that approach is actually going to be one that I can A, get useful results out, B, have something that can actually run on the machine that I'm looking at, and see whether or not it's going to be something that's going to be accurate and uh, useful to make my particular application more than just an experiment. So that's part of the challenges. Uh, the different kinds of neural networks, uh, CNNs, for example, are ones that are oftentimes used to identify uh, objects within an image, for example. Uh, the recurrent neural networks are ones that are often used with uh, data streams. Uh, for example, when you're uh, taking a look at uh, voice recognition, for example. Trying to figure out which one of these are and which models that are specifically going to be useful to you is a challenge in and of itself and could probably use an expert system. And you probably can use something like ChatGPT to narrow down the focus of what you can actually run on the microbes that you're looking at. So this is some of the uh, things that I mentioned with respect to neural networks. These are the kinds of uh, two are functions that are readily available. And a lot of these are now being employed or deployed with micro-based solutions. So microcontrollers, the, the Cortex-Ms, for example, that are at the bottom end these days, a lot of these functions are doable now. You still have the question of, you know, what are we talking about in terms of something like anomaly detection? If we're trying to look at anomaly of, say, just a motor and how it's rotating and what may be going on, that could be something that's very simple. If you're trying to look for anomaly detection on a network system with um, thousands of inputs that are coming in at uh, gigabit speeds and you're trying to track down anomalies within the data that's coming through to potentially look for, say, attacks on a system, that's potentially going to be something that's a lot harder to implement on something like our microcontrollers that we're talking about on the edge. So generative AI, just a quick uh, query. How many people have tried using generative AI, chat GPT, asking questions or making things? OK, excellent. The majority of you have done that. And one of the reasons is it's very easy to use, OK? All the other things that we've talked about on, on the uh, other neural networks, you had to build up a framework to be able to interface to it. You have to have the inputs coming in for something on your micro, and then you have to do something at the other end in terms of using that within your program. With generative AI, you can still potentially do that within an application. But what they've effectively done is made it a lot easier for you to specify something because it's typically a text prompt. And you're going to get something back immediately. So you're going to get some text back. You're getting image back. At this point, you get music. You can just back anything that you can figure out how to put together. Of course, the challenge is most of the people that are actually doing that in terms of constructing what the uh, generative AI is doing happens to be a very small subset of people that are working for Google and OpenAI and things like that, whereas everybody else here is actually just using it and essentially using it the same way that you use something like a fast Fourier transform, but it's something that you can easily incorporate into whatever workflow that you may have already. Now, you may ask, you know, if, if that's the case, why would I want something like generative AI on my uh, microcontroller or maybe my little robot over here, which is another type of embedded device? Well, in terms of the interaction that you're getting from generative AI, essentially you're providing some input, you're getting some feedback, and you can potentially build on that. That's exactly the kind of interface that you would potentially like for a robot that's going to interact with people. You'd like to be able to uh, either uh, talk to it or you know, have it recognize your gestures or recognize your actions. And that's the kind of thing that generative AI can essentially build on. So it is something that we would potentially like to have in a particular device. OK. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit was 
how we're going to be squeezing these things down into micros. If you're familiar with any of the uh, tools that are out there, one of the most popular frameworks out there is uh, TensorFlow. And that has been primarily used for the conventional neural networks for identification of things. And if you take a large model, if you have something like an x86 processor with a couple of gigabytes of memory and storage and things like that, you can easily run something on there. On the other hand, if you're trying to get it down into a small micro, uh, literally a chip that you know is smaller than your fingernail and uh, has maybe a megabyte or less of storage, then it becomes more of a challenge. And that's where you have to start looking at the trade-offs. There is a term out there called tiny ML. It is really just a term, a description. It's not as if it is a particular version of TensorFlow. On the other hand, TensorFlow Lite is essentially that scaled down version. The idea being that if you have a particular model that you can somehow squeeze that down into something that's going to be a little bit uh, easier to fit. And then you have to figure out on what the trade-offs are going to be. Now we get into some of the details in terms of the hardware. This is another reason why it's going to be challenging trying to figure out how you're going to squeeze something down into a micro, because there are essentially a variety of ways that you can actually accelerate and utilize machine learning models. Microcontrollers, which we were talking about, are the mainstay. And it is possible now to run some models on microcontrollers that exist that have no AI acceleration at all. And that's because it is possible to limit both the inputs and the functionality that you're trying to use. The thing is that we usually want to make things that are going to be bigger and faster. Uh, and that's where some of these other things come into play. In particular, on the micros, the latest micros, for example, on the Cortex-M family, have new instructions that are specifically designed to accelerate those kinds of AI algorithms. At the other extreme, we have AI accelerators. These are pieces of hardware that are specifically designed to process those kinds of uh, models or AI functionality at significantly higher speeds and at significantly lower power requirements, oftentimes by orders of magnitude. And uh, one of the things I didn't talk a lot about was training. Training some models requires a significant amount of input and a significant amount of uh, performance and a significant amount of storage. What they wind up with oftentimes is a model, which in turn is significantly smaller. And uh, in terms of being able to utilize that, it's significantly less power and performance required to do that. So that's one of the reasons why you'll see large servers with uh, GPUs or even AI accelerators in the cloud doing training on essentially thousands millions or even trillions of pieces of input. Once those things get processed, moving them down into something that can actually be used on a particular device becomes significantly easier. But still having some level of uh, acceleration will improve how well those things can be implemented in a particular device. So, um, in between, we have uh, GPUs, which I had mentioned. There's a significant company out there called NVIDIA, who essentially built their uh, AI solution on GPUs. Uh, field programmable uh, gate arrays, FPGAs. These are uh, essentially logic that you can use that is completely programmable. And essentially, you can come up with a logic diagram, have it implemented in there, and away it goes. Now, each one of these things has pluses and minuses. On the AI accelerator side, they're great if you know exactly what you're going to do. But if you're going to be changing the algorithms, you could potentially be out of luck. In particular, that's what's happening with generative AI. The approach that the 
tools have been optimized for, at least initially in this space, we're going after the neural networks like CNNs. So you may have a particular device that works great with a CNN, don't necessarily work as well with an RNN, or definitely won't work with a generative AI piece. FPGAs allow you to reconfigure things, but there's a significant overhead. That one logic gate in your diagram may look simple, but it may actually take multiple gates, multiple routing pieces to actually make that work. So they're very inefficient in terms of comparing them to a dedicated device that would uh, implement that same functionality. But they're very fast compared to a programmable piece, like something like, say, a GPU or even a CPU. So you have to figure out what the trade-off is in that. Another part is that when you're dealing with uh, AI models, one of the things that you'll always hear people talking about are weights. And what happens in the neural network is at each one of the little nodes, there is information that you are essentially saving in that area. And that's essentially encoded with a numeric value, which is called a weight. As the information is coming in, as it's going through these networks, there's a lot of matrix operations that are going on to take those weights and those inputs to essentially map them as they're going along. So that once you get out the other end, you have a result that says, oh, it's going to be a dog. It's going to be 98% based upon how well all those weights say that it was going to match. That's a very simplified way of looking at it. And it's really uh, only specific to something like a CNN. But in general, that's going to be the case. Now, those weight values, when everybody was starting out, were usually 32 or 64 bit floating point because they had tools like that available to them. And you know all the processors that were out there had that in their instruction set, and it was easy to implement. The problem is it wasn't real fast and it wasn't real efficient in terms of storage. What they have found is that for a lot of models, especially when you're trying to implement it on something like a micro, is you can squeeze those things down by changing the size of the weights and essentially reducing the amount of computation that you may have to do along the way. So, you know, everybody's uh, familiar with a bit and a byte and probably a floating point number. These are things that are fitting in between. And specifically, while they are also applicable to very large scale implementations in the cloud, they're almost a requirement when you start moving down into the micro and in at the edge space. So you can see at the top the 32-bit floating point, you know, it's 30 bits long. I mentioned, you know, uh, a change in, in terms of uh, the other floating point formats that are available here. Part of it is what are you trying to gain in terms of the trade-off and squeezing these things down? Are you looking for uh, more accuracy, okay, and uh, more precision, or are you looking for a wider range? Oftentimes, you're looking at more of a wider range. It is also possible to use integers instead of floating point. And likewise, the size of these things uh, can be squeezed down. You will find that these days, especially on the edge, int 8, which is actually just a, you know, a usual byte, is actually one of the popular ones that they provide in terms of performance metrics. But in terms of implementation, they actually squeeze it down to an int 4 or even uh, a Boolean. OK, so we're going to quickly go through some more details of, of what's going on. I have to move faster because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. And I wanted to take some questions. If you look at the higher end performance uh, processors, even on some embedded spaces, the x86 is a good example. These are the uh, Intel and AMD processors that are sitting in your PCs. Uh, they're used in a lot of embedded spaces. But what they've been doing is they've been enhancing the instruction sets for these things. In particular, uh, 
the AVX supports, which are uh, doing vector processing or essentially the matrix uh, operations that we're talking about, those have been there in the past, but now they've been optimized for dealing with those smaller uh, floating point and integer values that we were looking at before. Uh, in addition to that, there's oftentimes specific hardware accelerators that have been put together with these. The Ryzen AI is another example of those, but there essentially is more of an adjunct to what the main processor happens to be utilizing. And you're gonna see that as a very common solution, standard micro architecture of some sort, an AI accelerator that's going to be sitting off to the side and data is gonna be handed off and, and exchanged with the main processor. So that's actually one of the other things that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. And I think most of you do. If you are utilizing AI in an application, that's a subset of what is the application actually is. The AI may be used to present what graphics you have on there, but a conventional program is being used to actually put those graphics up onto the machine. It's the same thing that's actually going to be looking at all the uh, key presses you're doing, all the other inputs, but there's no such thing right now is a, an AI program that's just an AI system that is uh, running the kinds of models that we're talking about, either in generative AI or whatever. Okay. I mentioned the Cortex-M before. The Helium instructions are the ones that have enhanced that uh, platform. The nice thing is that they are a standardized set that everybody's gonna be able to use. The older Cortex M3s and M7s do not have something like that. The latest ones, the Cortex M85s, for example, are the ones that have this functionality built into them. And these are essentially uh, also generalized DSP or digital single processing enhancements because you're essentially dealing with uh, matrix multiplications and things of that nature, which can be quite useful for other applications, not just AI. In terms of dedicated processors, the Ethos U is, they're calling it a micro NPU, uh, and there are a number of classes of them. The U55 is the one that's typically tied with a Cortex M. The uh, N78 is the one that's typically tied with a Cortex A. Uh, the Cortex A being the higher level 64 bit processors. And on something like uh, the Samsung Galaxy that I have sitting in front of me here, that actually has multiple processors within this core, including multiple Cortex uh, A type platforms. Okay. Here's a whole bunch of examples out there of various combinations, either dedicated systems like the Renaissance, which is just using the instructions that are built in. Uh, and at the other extreme, you have something like the uh, Aleph Crescendo, which has a Cortex, uh, actually has a bunch of Cortex A's and a bunch of Cortex M's and an Ethos uh, neural processor all built into it. Now, here comes one of the challenges that developers are going to have when they're dealing with utilizing these micros is where are you actually going to run the model that you have? Also, the majority of applications that are using AI models and including generative AI are actually using multiple models along the way. So where it runs may depend on how much information, how big the model is, how much performance you require out of it and how you're uh, going to spread it across them because potentially you can actually split how a model is implemented across processors and processing types. So certain parts of the model may be done in uh, an acceler accelerator like the Ethos, and some of it may be done in just your conventional processor. That is part of the challenge of making this stuff work, but it's also what can actually make it practical to have applications that are extremely sophisticated on a very small device. Um, I was gonna sort of mention the Ambic Spot technology. In terms of looking at devices and mobile devices that are battery operated, using technologies like that in conjunction with AI acceleration means that you could have a device that is uh, either very small or one that can run for a very long time. 
like years or decades running off of either solar panels or a very small battery. But those are the kinds of applications that we're talking about here where you want to be able to have AI on the edge, but have it around and reliable over a long period of time. Here's the latest uh, set that's sitting out in the various smartphones. I'm not gonna go into those in too much detail, but some of them do have generative AI support. So it's not as if generative AI just showed up this past year. They've been working on it for a long time. Getting something like this into hardware is actually a very challenging process. These chips were designed literally years before and having to lock down the logic in those chips is something that somebody had to make a decision on quite a while ago. And as we mentioned before, some of these uh, platforms have been able to support conventional neural networks and CNNs to do some identification, but to do the generative AI support that they've been looking at is something that those things couldn't do very well. Uh, you'll notice that in the advertisements, you know, looking at the latest features, you know, for example, on Samsung, you can circle uh, an image that uh, has something in it. It can then go and find something very similar to that. That is a functionality that is not being pushed back to the smartphones in the Samsung line that are much older. They simply can't do that. They don't have the space. Even if you wanted to circle it and wait, you know, 15 minutes for it to happen, it wouldn't fit in that time frame because of the level of acceleration that's involved with those enhanced uh, devices. Let's see. And you can see that, you know, in terms of the specifications, we're talking about billions of parameters. Those are essentially those inputs that are associated with what this is going on. And it's all being done in the device as opposed to being shipped to the cloud. It's also the reason why when you were talking about utilizing generative AI in the cloud, that it's significant because we're talking about trillions of uh, inputs. And that's essentially what you're looking at when they're taking a look at all the data that's on, say, the internet and trying to pull that in so they can essentially provide you with a search engine functionality. It had to have access to those trillions of pieces of input. It actually gets more complex than that, but I'm not going to go into those level of detail. I mentioned NVIDIA before. They are obviously providing these high-end uh, GPUs for the cloud. They run kilowatts in terms of performance. But at the other end of the spectrum, they have their uh, Jetson family, uh, usually high performance chips compared to uh, a lot of other platforms out there. They're more akin to what you'd find in high performance smartphones, but uh, significantly bigger than say that little two by two Cortex M micro that I was talking about before. One of the other challenges you have in terms of dealing with these is the software. In terms of what NVIDIA has been doing, in terms of building up software that runs from these Jetson lines all the way up to the H100s, they have essentially a compatible family so that you can essentially build your models arbitrarily, uh, then try to figure out how you can force fit them down to the spot that you want and how optimized you may want to, to make it. Typically, with a Jetson, you're going to have one of these things. It's going to be sitting off in a dedicated space. With the H100s, they're going to be in clouds, and you're pretty sure you're going to have racks of these things with hundreds of them. One's designed for communicating and sharing things. The other one's designed to be a standalone device. Uh, Intel, AMD also have um, some of their tools along the way. The Types of implementations oftentimes vary. The Jetson is actually a general SOC, which has a lot of AI acceleration tacked into it. Uh, and it, they, it's actually a family which uh, you can start out with the Jetson Nano, and it goes uh, all the way up to ones that are designed for use in uh, uh, self-driving cars. The difference between the two is the number of processors, the number of accelerators that wind up being added in, and the complexity of those things. 
at the one extreme, you have something that is going to be able to run very large neural networks that can effectively take, uh, say, eight or 16 video streams and do identification and everything in real time and essentially be used for something like a surveillance system to recognize what's wandering through. Is it one person? Is it two person? Is it a particular person? Is it a dog or whatever? It can have that level of functionality. Jetson Nano, you can probably do it with one or two streams. Uh, you can't necessarily get the same level of uh, functionality in terms of range or potentially you're going to be looking at trade-offs in terms of accuracy, depending upon how you scale down your model. But you can still perform those kinds of functions. On the FPA, the FPGA side, as I mentioned before, FPGAs, you can take a logic diagram, drop it in, and it's going to implement it. That works well for a lot of things. But in terms of taking uh, an AI model or an implementation that can uh, be loaded with an AI model, the implementation compared to other approaches is not necessarily going to be as efficient. So if you want to do a lot of AI processing with an FPGA, one of the things that you oftentimes turn to, something called hard logic. That's essentially the same kind of logic that all the other micros are in that's not going to change in any fashion. It's going to do a, a specific function. There are two ways that uh, FPGAs have been utilized to take advantage of hard logic. One is dedicated processors. So for example, uh, if you want a bank of Cortex-A processors, there's a version of uh, the various FPGAs out there that have that in them. They also have typically DSP blocks, which are much more efficient than implementing the DSP functionality in the raw FPGA logic. What they've done with the AI support is essentially enhanced or replaced or added to those DSP blocks so that the logic you're doing in terms of the customization can then take advantage of that hard logic, which is now faster and more compact and more power efficient. The trade-off is, of course, how many of these do you need, how are you going to implement it, and so on, but that's up to a designer that has to contend with them. Now we're going to get into uh, some of the dedicated uh, pieces of hardware. And uh, Intel has a number of them. Uh, the Gaudi 3 is an interesting one. Uh, and you'll see that the architecture looks a lot like a GPU does. Essentially, they have some specialized processors and they try to replicate them as much as they can. And that's because, you know, as we're looking at these uh, various models and you're looking at the layers and the kinds of operations that are being done, it's essentially the same kind of thing being done over and over and over again. You just need to be able to do a lot of that in parallel. And that's what these things implement. The trick is why they have, you know, larger uh, tensor processor type things is the actual operations and so on that are going to be done in that space are ones that can be potentially programmatically optimized. And they do ha essentially have that capability. It's not as if you're going to take a, uh, a, a model and just sort of drop it onto this platform. Now, functionally, that's what you're going to be doing. But it winds up being compiled essentially down and the big difference between what we went through in the past, where everybody was using assemblers and uh, essentially having direct access to the system, we're doing more what is happening with things like GPUs and so on, where you have a much higher level definition of what's going to be dropped in there. Compiler is actually going to then implement that down into the instructions or the uh, other connections that are involved within the accelerator. And you're not going to see any of that. Okay. Here's another one, uh, Halo. Uh, they have two versions out. Uh, and the second one is targeting vision processing in specific. And you can see in terms of performance, you know, there's a, a significant difference. Uh, also, I didn't put the actual wattage down for the Halo 15, but it is higher. On the other hand, in terms of power perform, power per or no, performance per power, it's an improvement. And essentially, it can wind up handling you know, the, the data streams, 
this will actually handle multiple data streams on the order of what uh, something like the Invedi uh, Judson can handle, but it's going to be significantly more power efficient. And in terms of actual size, it's also significantly smaller. So from a designer's perspective, could I just take a standard off the shelf uh, Cortex-A or Cortex-M micro, pair it with one of these accelerators as a separate chip, pop it on my solution and have something that's smaller, faster and more functionality than I would if I took something like a Jetson. It's a hard trade off to make, but it is possible. Uh, brain chip is one that I was going to bring up because one of the things that it, it can do, and part of this because of the models and things that we're talking about, is it can do some incremental learning after the fact. When we're talking about things like uh, CNNs, typically those things are trained once. If you want to improve them, you give additional training material, you do that in the cloud, you generate a new model, and you take that whole model and you download it to the device, which is fine if you want to have you know, de incremental device upgrades and things of that nature. However, if you want the device to actually improve in some fashion and you have some way of indicating whether or not new input is going to be better or worse, you can incrementally improve a particular device's implementation. Doing that in hardware, if you haven't planned on it, is going to be hard. They, on the other hand, have incorporated that into their particular design. It is also much more of a standalone device if you want, because it does have uh, additional SOC performance type built into it. Uh, but that's not necessarily a requirement. This could be used, uh, the SOC portion could be used as a traffic cop to tie it into uh, another host that you may have. Uh, Google's TPU is another interesting piece. Uh, and it's obviously one that they've been utilizing internally. This is the low end TPU as opposed to the higher one that they've been utilizing in their cloud performance. Uh, the thing is that the, uh, the this is essentially targeted at more standalone environments. You're not going to be seeing a lot of TPUs uh, of this caliber tied together on a system. It's typically going to be a, a more standalone embedded device. And you can see that in terms of specifications, I, I put uh, you know a number of tops and the fact that it is essentially an int eight based solution, uh, again, those are trade-offs that you're gonna to have to, to worry about in terms of your models and so on, as to what kinds of things you're going to be processing uh, and what type of accuracy you're going to be getting based upon how you've managed to recompile and optimize your model. Uh, Qualcomm's AI accelerator. Uh, just more of an example of how you can see these things implemented. The same chip or set of chips is either showing up on a little M.2 device. This is the, the same format as the uh, flash drives that are embedded in most of the systems these days, definitely in terms of laptops. And they're, you know, size of a postage stamp if you want to look at it that way. All the way up to standard uh, plug-in cards for a processor. Okay. All right. So just as sort of a recap, the, uh, the memory performance and power utilization are the trade-offs that you're going to have to contend with if you're going to be trying to put uh, any type of AI onto a particular device. And as you can see, there's a wide selection of the platforms you can put it on. There's a wide selection in terms of how you can potentially compress something down. And there's a wide variety of the kinds of uh, areas, models or whatnot, whether it's CNN, generative AI, that you have to choose from. You're gonna to have to figure out how you're going to utilize these things in whatever in application that you're going to be putting together. And you also have to consider how many of those models, different kinds of models that you may be utilizing along the way. So for example, uh, if you have a camera that's being used in a car, one of the things it's potentially going to want to do is identify a particular 
objects. So you can have essentially a model which is going to identify objects that are out there. You have another model that's been trained. Once you've isolated that particular model, what is that particular thing that's out there? So there you're at least using two models. You may have also used the model to enhance the, the image or either of the images once you've isolated it. So you can potentially start seeing how you have multiple models within a piece of hardware that you're going to have to be running either in parallel or sequentially to get a particular job done. And that becomes quite challenging. Let's see, okay. So as I mentioned, uh, there are a number of ways to do the optimization to get whatever model you have to work on a platform that has got either less uh, power or less performance than where you actually tested it out. And most people, when they're actually developing something, will typically work on a, a higher performance platform so they can get their algorithm down, they can make sure that everything works, and then they have to sort of figure out how they're going to squeeze this thing down into a smaller platform. And then they have to work on what kind of trade-offs are going to be involved because it may be possible to get it down to something that's just using some enhanced instructions, or you may have to have multiple processors and some NPUs built into it and so on to actually make it practical. So large language models, these are the ones on the cloud that have trillions or even more. It's, this is the reason why you have this you know, giant building that's going to be sucking down more power than a small town just to run models. The thing is that it's typically either working on very large pieces of data or very large problems or lots of input or lots of actually lots of users. So for example, the, the systems that are uh, supporting something like ChatGPT are supporting lots of users. On the other hand, when we're dealing with embedded systems, we're typically dealing with one user or one particular application. And we have what is called small language models, which are really more nothing more than large language models squished down in some fashion. And how they're squished down is typically by reducing the uh, number of inputs and things of that nature so that you actually have it down to a practical limit. The challenge is trying to figure out what that limit is. In other words, can I go down to 10? Probably not. A million at this point is the order of magnitude that most uh, embedded systems are looking at. You may be able to get it down into the tens of thousands. It's going to be very application dependent and I think that's actually an interesting area of research at this point in time is to how far down can you actually make one of these things practical. It also depends upon what the actual uh, operation is. Are you trying to generate music, for example? Are you trying to generate more images? Are you trying to generate feedback? Are you trying to generate plans? You can use uh, ChatGPT or other uh, systems like that to say, okay, here's some programming code. I'm going to give you some, rewrite it or check for bugs or do any one of those things. That's a useful task. Is it something that you could do on a, an embedded device? Probably. How well can you do it? That's going to be a challenge. Is there a particular application that you can think of that's going to be able to do the same kind of process, but going to be something that's definitely more applicable to an embedded space? Probably. But again, trying to figure out what those things are, where they're going to fit, is actually going to be an interesting challenge in and of itself. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and uh, see if anybody has any questions. We have uh, just a few minutes, but uh, let's start down here. Uh, one of the big technologies that, uh, or breakthroughs in generative AI was uh, memory. And I was wondering if there's any similar or equivalent technology that's been waited for microprocessors? Usually, um, anything that is applicable at uh, the higher performance level is something that translates down. The 
typical thing that you see in terms of discussion is how can I optimize what is a standard implementation? Because one of the things you don't want to do is have an implementation that you figured out how it's going to work in the cloud or some large platform and shrink it down and essentially have to completely redo what's going on. So most of the work is being done in terms of on the hardware, what's going to be the platform that's going to give you the most bang for the buck. And then in the software at the compiler level, which is going to say, okay, I'm gonna take this input, I'm going to be able to map it to my particular piece of hardware. And that's where I'm going to be able to uh, get the performance because of that. I guess my question was more about what, is there any technology or future technology that um, would be considered a breakthrough in the microprocessor space, say better or more efficient memory usage or um, more efficient use of electricity or some type of technology that would better complement or improve in an exponential um, unfortunately, I don't think that there's anything that has or will be uh, exclusive to the low end. Anything that is useful at that end is just as useful at the high end. And in general, uh, there are a lot of places where work is being done. For example, you think about matrix multiplication uh, and matrix operations. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done, and I just saw a couple of papers where the improvements on the order of you know 10 or 20 percent, and it's just how they're doing it or where they're taking the partial sums and, and utilizing them elsewhere. That's applicable across the board, uh, even in the programmatic side. If you just you know have no hardware acceleration, that's going to be an improvement in that area. We're seeing a good bit of uh, optimizations along the way, and this you've uh, seen from outfits like NVIDIA, where you see maybe a doubling or an order of magnitude performance increase over a, a period of a year, simply because they've optimized their compilers. There's a lot of, that we don't know, um, but and a lot that's being enhanced along the way. So uh, there's nothing in, specifically in terms of storage or or an algorithm or something like that that's typically going to make uh, a difference that's going to be unique just to the embedded space. There are more hardware uh, improvements in general for microcontrollers that are making a difference. Yes? So you described the spectrum of devices, less expensive, more expensive, um, less capability. Um, from a software developer's point of view, if I was looking towards the lower cost end of the spectrum, and I was agnostic about the device, whether it's an SOC or an SOC or just a microcontroller with an external accelerator. Um, I would take a step back and ask the question, what have you seen in the tools for development that makes that job easier, faster, and more quickly? At this point in time, I would say every company that has a microcontroller out there has an AI aspect to it. And if we're talking at this point about the neural networks, CNNs and things like that, the tool sets that those things are providing are very functional and relatively easy to use. They are also using essentially the inputs from those standard models out there. So if you take something that you developed in TensorFlow and, or PyTorch or something like that, and you wanted to move it down, those models are typically something that can then be presented to those compilers. And once they come out with an output, you can now figure out how big a platform you're going to have to choose to make that work. So it's fairly scalable, but there are Yes, and that's where the trade-off's going to come in. Uh, some of it may be obvious in terms of the the types of examples you're going to run, other ones you may have to actually run into the field to find out whether or not the accuracy and precision and whatnot of your model is going to be good enough for the application that you want. So I can take one more. Yes. Is there any fun or practical projects that you would recommend experimenting with or you know, specific depth or specific 
the custody gate or something that exists out there that should be a good starting place. If you go to electronic design, there's some uh, kit close-up videos that I've done, and you can take a look at some of those. It is not exhaustive, but uh, a lot's going to depend on what you think is going to be interesting. For example, there is a little device that I, I have taken a look at. I can't remember which company it is, but it's a little square cube that had a camera in it. And effectively, it could do image recognition. And you could essentially program that because uh, it had a built-in SOC, a USB interface, all sorts of nice little things like that. Uh, if you're looking for something that's more general, I would suggest a Jetson Nano. It's relatively inexpensive. The tool set is very good. It's, like I mentioned, one that's scaled all the way up and down. Uh, you could effectively use your PC to do most of the development and then move it down into that. Um, most of the other smaller micros have development kits. And again, it's going to be what are you trying to uh, actually utilize in terms of input. Do you need a camera input? Do you need a network input? Do you need an analog input for talking to various sensors? Uh, do you need an expansion board that you're going to buy some standard sensors and pop some things in there? That's where you know it's going to become more of a challenge trying to determine which thing you're going to want to actually pick up in the long run. Luckily, a lot of these things are relatively inexpensive. So if you buy one, you can learn something with it, and then you can move on to something else. Uh, so, Thanks. sure. Well, uh, okay, one more. Yes, and so uh, is it possible to do a completely isolated system? Uh, it's a common environment to do, uh, let's say, uh, funny enough, a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the things that you need in order to be able to do a Raspberry Pi on uh, to? Single user, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, what tools would you use to have a system that is sort of functional? Obviously, it's a system. I'm sorry, what time do you finish? In one minute. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> Just was wondering if we're going to explain to you. Yes, okay. Um, most of the standard platforms from Arduino to uh, Raspberry Pi have a variety of pieces of software out there that are supporting. <laughs> both uh, AI development as well as utilizing models that are and even applications that you can enhance. So definitely check those out. Uh, but unfortunately, I need to wrap up. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>